All right. That should have gone ahead and gotten us started. Hopefully, the recording turns out all right. OBS is always a little weird when recording. Um, so, I'm assuming it should go well. All right. Awesome. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Everybody can see the slides, yeah? Awesome, thanks. Cool. So today we'll be talking about the last and probably most complex concept um, that we're applying when we're building our computer, and that's the the RAM, right? Um, now we use the term RAM sparingly um, in the sense that um, it's really just the registers for our computer. Now, as you know, um, in terms of how a general computer works, there is a persistent, you know, written memory involved in the computer, right? Um, and that's the sort of stuff we use to store the code that we're writing. So that's the, the lines of code, the ROM that we built a while back. So we understand how to build that architecture and that's all good and taken care of. Um, now we're going to do the, um, the actual persistent memory, the memory that um, is, well, uh, the memory that's maintained um, while programs are executing, the memory that can be accessed and changed by the programs themselves. In other words, just the registers that we've got um, for the code right now. Now in real computers in real life, um, you have a memory schema that looks sort of like, um, you know, you've got a very limited number of registers and that's the fastest type of memory that they can use. Um, then you've got their cache, which is a, you know, another fast type of memory. Um, and then after a bunch of levels of cache, you've got, uh, you know, actual physical memory that you can kind of address outside of the processor and then you have the ability to write to disk and then pull back from that and the reason that that computers in real life um, have all those different constructs is because memory like registers are actually quite expensive to build registers are considered the fastest way to access memory um, and any type of memory right from a point in computing um, and the bigger schemas that they've got on top of that, like RAM um, and disk and all that, they're cheaper to build, but much higher in capacity. So if, you know, if we all had our way, we could just build a computer with like tons of, of registers, you know, per se, but it would be ridiculously expensive and hard to address and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's why computers in real life go with a schema like that. Um, but what we'll do is we'll kind of, take it a lot simpler and instead of building multiple levels of memory uh, all we're going to do is build some registers and call it a day right um, so the drawback here is that we don't have much persistent memory to play with but the bonus is um, we get the best I mean the fastest memory um, to mess around with albeit in a limited capacity so that's why we're getting away with just building registers for our memory right um, mainly because it's the, the fastest level of memory and that's just what we're dealing with. Cool. So we got our your usual announcements, projects five, six, and seven. Um, you know, obviously a little different here. Um, projects five and six, we've kind of already taken a look at, right? Now project seven is just about our finish up, right? Our last last swing of things. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about this. Now we've built the ALU, the brains of the operation. Now what we need to do is a few more things to take this from just a calculator circuit to an actual computer, right? And, you know, I've given you this spiel multiple times so far, so sorry for the deja vu. Um, and what we're, we're on today is the ways to store data for these programs while they're executing, right? Um, that's our, our big thing. That's our deal today. And that's what we'll be going through. And we're going to be using digital logic circuit theory to build circuits to address this last one as well. Right. So project seven would be RAM, right? And we'll be talking about ways to store data for these programs using registers of RAM. So like I said before, the words registers and RAM are going to be interchangeable for today, right? So that's what I would, I would consider the two interchangeable um, for the purpose of what we're going over today. So let's figure out our approach to this, right? Currently we have circuits in place to iterate through lines of code that we've written and provide us the exact instruction for every line. Awesome. Now, while our interpreter circuit, while we ourselves have not yet created it, is actually executing that code, where will it store the values it calculates? 
right? In other words, you know, we're going to be doing stuff like, uh, and, and you wrote the assembly, right? So you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I change R1, R2, R3. Um, all that stuff needs to be messed with somehow. Actually, well, I don't know about R1. Um, but that's our, our RAM, the memory that needs to be changed while our program is executing. So we need fast access modifiable memory that we can use to store the values that we calculate, right? Now, these are the two key words here because first of all, we need to be able to access quickly. In other words, within a single clock cycle, because remember, we talked about a, a clock iterating us through the lines of code, right? So we need that memory access to happen quickly so we can pull the data out, right? Um, and then write it back all before the next clock cycle happens, right? And this is a moment where, I mean, if you've taken like 411 or you think about a pipeline machine, um, that might not be how it works in a pipeline machine. But what we do is we make sure that every single clock cycle, right, we fetch an instruction, um, we interpret it, we execute it, and then we write it, all the, you know, changed stuff back to memory before the next cycle starts. That's our goal. So we want this RAM to be ac accessible fast enough in our CPU such that we can say, okay, give me the instruction, all right, I'll interpret the instruction, and whatever has changed because of it, we're gonna write that back to memory, and then the next instruction is, is allowed to start right after that. We don't particularly have any like safety stuff in, in, in terms of, um, you know, it's not like the next cycle will be delayed until our write back is complete. That's not true. Um, it's just a matter of knowing that, okay, our clock cycle is going to, you know, our next clock cycle is going to happen probably after um, the functionality for this clock cycle is done and taken care of. So since we're sort of eyeballing it, we need to make sure that we're saving time um, as much as possible, right? Um, because in other words, slower memory means that we're going to end up having slower clock cycles, right? Or we're going to have to build ourselves a slower clock cycle. Does that make sense? Because we're going to be, you know, at each program counter iteration, um, we're going to make sure that all the memory access is done. Then we're only, only then are we going to move on to the next um, clock cycle. And that, again, is not enforced by the circuit. We have to manually kind of make sure that we're, we're accounting for that uh, when we're building our clock cycle. And I think it's, it's worth noting that, you know, circuit design in real life, digital logic design is kind of the same right? Um, CPUs need to make sure that their clock cycles are long enough um, for the rest of the circuit to kind of settle, um, for everything to kind of work out so that the clock cycles won't go too fast and screw up all the processing that's going on in between. I guess in, in other words, that's kind of why we have that finite, you know, amount of clock cycle for each processor. Um, and if you clock past, um, I don't know, maybe the overclock limit, right? Because they sometimes it's like heat that's a concern. Um, then your processor will just not produce um, expected results. Because the, I mean, it's just as simple as the electricity can't travel to the circuit that fast. Or fast enough to be um, changing memory in the way that it should. So that's why we need fast modifiable memory. In other words, we need registers for our computer. Right now, if registers is confusing to you, I want you to think back to 216 and assembly because that's where we, you know, we kind of screw around with the um, the abstract concept of registers, right? At the end of the day, these requirements are pretty much filled out by our quote-unquote random access memory, right? So first, we're going to look at the concept as a whole, and then we're going to figure out why exactly it's the perfect choice for us here. Finally, we're going to talk about the implementation um, that we're going to use in Minecraft. So let's go ahead and, and get into it. All right, before we do that, here's the diagram that I keep throwing at you over and over. And the green is just a reminder of what we've already kind of gotten through, right? So program counter, taken care of, all green, we built that. Um, I mean, B6, it's, it's not too bad. Um, and P5 is kind of all about ROM, right? You've written your code, you've figured out a way to um, to interpret it as well, uh, we don't assign the interpreting code just because it, it was a was a huge pain of a project when when um, when we did it. So we just kind of gloss over that part when assigning work to give you. <laughs> um, but that was that was a pretty killer project. So that's why I've labeled it red here. But we can kind of soonish assume that this circuitry to interpret the code right 
In other words, basically what, what it all, all was was like logic gets to decide, okay, is this a branch statement, right? Um, you would literally like and a few bits at the very beginning of the line of ROM um, to see if it was a jump statement or a yeah, branch statement. And if it was, you'd build some stuff to change, like add, add a certain amount to the program counter, all that cool stuff. So basically circuitry to interpret that code, um, it's there, it exists, right? In order to make that function properly, we need to give that code the interpreting circuitry, an easy way to access and pull back stuff um, from the registers, right? So that's what we're going to be building today, the registers themselves. Um, and in your, your next project, you know, um, you'll see uh, that it's, with the testing, it'll be pretty easy, I mean, pretty intuitive to, um, to build these registers and see how they're being accessed um, and changed. So, Let's talk about RAM as a concept before we hop into RAM in Minecraft. It's known as random access memory, and of course, it's the quickest memory in a computer that we can pull from and write to. And that's a coincidence because that's totally what we need, right? As such, this is the computer architecture structure that we've decided other programs will be reading and writing to reliably and quickly while they execute. So keep in mind that we're not just making this stuff up, right? We're following a general recipe. Um, the overall structure of our computer is kind of adhering to this whole model called the um, the von Neumann computing model. We'll talk a little bit about that in the final lecture when we introduce the final project. Or just soon, my friends. <laughs> so keep in mind that for our case, RAM and registers will be used interchangeably, right? Uh, we're kind of being a little loose with the terms here, but I mean, for all intents and purposes, this is our sort of um, volatile physical memory, right? So what do the computer gods say about how we should build our RAM? Well, the cool part is we got sticks of RAM here, and in, we're going to build sticks of RAM in Minecraft. But here are the requirements for such a thing, right? Volatility. RAM is only useful when the circuit is powered on and will lose all data that it's storing when the computer powers off. That is for better or for worse, right? The better part is um, you get a nice reset when you restart your computer. So good stuff. I mean, that's one small reason. Um, why, I mean, people assume that turning off the computer and turning it back on uh, will make it, I don't know, will we'll clean it up, make it like somewhat faster, right? Or, or fix any, resolve any like memory leaks or other garbage sitting around in your RAM. Um, you know, to some extent that's that's probably true, but you know, that's the, the volatility aspect of it. So just trying to relate that to some sort of phenomenon that you may have encountered. And of course, access equality. Now this is important. We want to make sure that it takes the same-ish amount of time to access any address of RAM, right? So you don't want like uh, perhaps the um, the middle addresses of RAM, like addresses 25 to 50, perhaps taking um, a lot less time to access than addresses 1 through 25 and 50 through 75, right? These are just arbitrary numbers, but you can kind of understand that we want access equality. And what I'm trying to say in this is really make the statement that we need a compact design. We need it all to be squished together in such a way that it doesn't take our redstone signal like 300 years to go all the way to address 75 in our RAM um, and take much less time to go to address zero. So in other words, we want to promote and maintain access equality as much as possible. And the way we're going to do that is by compacting our design as much as we possibly can. Um, so hopefully that sort of makes sense. That's what we're trying to do there. Um, and that's how we'll accomplish something like that, conceptually, of course. So how do we achieve this access equality? I kind of already talked a little bit about it, but really we're going to be leveraging a MUX and DMUX combination, right? So we can efficiently access one of hundreds, thousands or more memory addresses in a cluster of RAM. Now you know the multiplexer and demultiplexer are the gift that keeps on giving. Because we've used them multiple times here, but they are excellent in terms of turning a lot of addresses or a lot of wiring into, you know, a, a literal exponential amount less of wiring. Um, so again, it's a blessing that we have these at our disposal, and we're going to use them to address uh, this RAM. So. A little bit of computer world stuff for you, some background, since, you know, we do have freedom in, in what we teach here, so here's some, some neat business. Uh, and this is also covered in 4.11, so, you know, just throwing it out there. 
There are two types of RAM in the computer world, static RAM and dynamic RAM, right? And what you basically need to know is that static RAM is just circuits and dynamic RAM is just circuits plus a capacitor, right? So SRAM is generally faster than DRAM, which is why it's mainly employed in the cache. So that's the expensive stuff, right? This is the, the good stuff. It's the caviar of RAM. It's very, uh, very expensive and we usually use it in the, um, the faster access um, parts of RAM. This is the stuff that's needed the most. And DRAM actually takes up less space, right? It seems counterintuitive, but it's true. The circuit is less complex, um, but we use the capacitor um, to kind of to back it up, right? And as such, we use DRAM in the actual RAM chips on our computers. So when you put a RAM stick into the PC that you're building, that would be DRAM, dynamic RAM, right? Um, and that's why it's called DDR4, DDR5. It, it doesn't stand for Dance Dance Revolution. It stands for like dynamic something. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure. I, I don't know the acronym, but it's definitely not Dance Dance Revolution. Um, but those are the two types of RAM that we use, right? Now, the reason that I'm pointing out this difference is because, um, like I said, in computer, in a computer world, it's all about cost, right? It's really expensive to build this fast access um, cache RAM, and it's a fair amount cheaper to build um, this, not, not as fast, but still quite speedy access um, RAM stick that they use, right? And that's their whole deal. They're basically saying, okay, look, computers are kind of expensive. So to make up to make up this illusion of speed that we've got, because you know that you won't be accessing all one terabyte of your hard drive all the time, what we can do is we can say, okay, um, here's the deal. We'll give you a terabyte of memory, um, but maybe we'll give you like 16 gigabytes of RAM, random access memory. And that's going to be the stuff that you can read from and write to really fast. Um, but let's say you're doing even more stuff, right? So the computer says, all right, we'll give you a few megabytes of cache as well. Um, and you can read and write to that way faster than you do the RAM. Um, and so on and so forth. Computers have policies and, um, you know, algorithmically, they deal with this sort of construct. Um, and they kind of make the best of what they're given, right? Um, they try to use that, that cache, that fastest memory, as much as they can. And then only write back to RAM if they need to and then only write back to disk if they need to, need to, right? Um, just because it takes a lot more time to write to disk, and it takes you know, a fair amount of time to write to RAM, and it's pretty quick to write to cache, and, you know, fastest to write to, like, registers, right? So again, it is easy for us because all we're doing is building registers, so we don't need to ever make any decisions or build in any of the architecture that says, hey, man, we shouldn't use cache this time, or no, sorry, hey, man, we shouldn't use ROM, RAM this time, we should hop back to our cache. None of that business for us. We have just one schema. We just have registers. So no need for misses or, or anything like that. No fancy business. We are taking it easy with that stuff. But that's how it does work in real life. Now, since we don't have to worry about silly things like power consumption or storage bandwidth, due to the fact that our computer is about as smart as a saguaro cactus, we don't need to worry about differentiating between RAM architectures or even building a cache. Instead, all we really need is just a reliable way for the programs that we're executing to be able to read and write memory um, while they're running. So, good stuff. We're kind of, I mean, in classic 3D like E fashion, we're, we're simplifying it down. Um, it's an oversimplification of events, but it checks out. You know, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. We're just kind of making it easier on ourselves and assuming we have the money to build a fair amount of registers um, and nothing else. So here's our RAM would look at a computer. Now, as we go over this, go ahead and try to relate these components to digital logic components you've learned about already. And again, like I said, you know all this stuff already to build something like this, right? Um, it's just a matter of figuring out, you know, how to put it all together. So right off the bat, this little diagram that we've got here, which is a bit small on the screen, so I apologize, but hopefully you can kind of read what we've got here. And what we have is row and column select. For our, our RAM, right? Now we're going to be building something rather similar to this. Um, don't worry, not, not as many nodes. I mean, this is a, a humongous amount of, of nodes, right? Um, but you can see that what we've got here um, is on the left um, row addressing bits, right? And these are fed, um, you know, into a mux demux sort of business, right? where you have only n amount of 
select your bits, right? So you specify a row that you want your memory cell from. And then over here, we have two to the power of n rows. And now, you know, if you see this, you'll recognize classic multiplexer, right? Um, by providing a set amount of select bits, right? We can see exactly which row that we want to select. So we can, you know, provide uh, these one through n bits here, right? We can tell our ROM what we want to select from here. Similarly, in the column address, we provide one through m, right? Usually we can, we can make n and m equal, but it doesn't have to be equal. But with this, we get the liberty to basically have two to the power of n times two to the power of m bits of memory. Now that's kind of crazy that that make that gives us a lot of options, right? Um, and to select it, all we really need is, you know, um, n and m. So, I, I mean, the sky's the limit. We're really pushing it here with the amount of of a uh, RAM that we can select from. An easy way to think about this is, you know, you're kind of just providing coordinate plane addresses, right? Um, you're giving it an X coordinate and a Y coordinate in, in the bits that you've got. Um, and your circuit goes in and finds that X and Y combination and tells you what the data will actually be um, at that um, point in the memory, right? Um, and you can see that it's got that classic multiplexer. You might be wondering, okay, well, I noticed that there's no input or output wire for these multiplexers. You just have the select wires. And that's because in this circuit, this, the um, input and output wires are actually way down here at the bottom where you see data out and data in. Oh, that was cool. I think I just highlighted it there for a second, oh, but maybe not. And that's where the data will actually be coming out and coming in. So you'll be building something rather similar, right? This is just conceptually introducing it to you. Um, but it's basically that. And I, I mean, I want to add that if you've got those structure blocks and stuff working, it's really just a matter of building one stick of RAM, right? And then copy pasting it over and over again. You just have to build one proper register and then just yeet it a bunch of times and you're good to go. <laughs> like, it's not too bad of a project. That being said, RAM and Minecraft. So we're, we're bridging the gap. So previously on 39E, you worked with ROM, which was read-only. And you've also seen the background for basic latches. Remember, latches are just augmented flip-flops. And if you need a refresher on that, feel free to look back at the memory lecture, right? And we'll talk about, you know, um, just exactly how a flip-flop is built. But um, we didn't introduce that for no reason because this is where it comes back. We also talked about using a form of latch-based storage to keep track of the numbers we were counting for our program counter. So the good news is you kind of already built literally everything that you need, right? You've put together some sort of latch setup for your PC and you've already built, um, you know, addressing um, like multiplexer and demultiplexer. Come on, you know that stuff like the back of your hand. So really all we're doing is we're building that program counter register many, many times, um, copying it, right? Making sure it's pretty compact. Like I, I don't, I don't want to see these RAM blocks very distanced out one from another because remember access equality is rather important to us um and you'd be surprised if you build these like fairly far out um you will have trouble when it comes to actually executing your code so remember that redstone travels at a fairly um what's the word here observable pace like it is it is kind of easy to let the speed of it get away from you um so i'm not saying um mush it together as much as possible I'm basically just saying, don't be all loosey-goosey and build it super far from each other because it will not work. Um, just a, um, yeah, no, that was just a, a word of warning. And by the way, it's not that you can't build these like two blocks from each other or something. I'm saying things like don't build each stick like 15 blocks from each other because your addressable memory is going to be a little tough um, to work with if you do that. So again, don't worry about that. I, I know I'm being a little vague with the um the advice there. Uh, just don't build them super far apart because remember you can't afford that in terms of um data access time. All right. So what I'm trying to say here is you know the stuff. You've seen the components. Now it's just a matter of throwing it all together, right? So think of this next problem that we we're tackling as a further exploration of consistent value storage. A beautiful combination of the last two projects that you worked on, right? We're going to store data in a similar way to what you've seen in the ROM, using a neat decoder-based technique to read from it. And we're going to use latches in a fairly intelligent way. 
similar to what you saw in the program counter project in order to write data. So again, just a reminder that you've done this stuff before. You were just combining the knowledge that you gained um, with the new conceptual understanding that you have of RAM. Now before, all you did was create a single register that could be added to and subtracted from every cycle. Now our goal is to do two things. First of all, we're going to remove any extraneous bits from that PC circuit, right? And cut that down to a way more compact, way more modular form, right? We want to make it a lot less ugly and make it so that we can moosh a bunch of these RAM sticks together. So in other words, what we're trying to do is kind of, I mean, aesthetically, right? This is this is how I did my, my RAM implementation. It was just to make it more vertical um, than before, right? It would build on top of it itself kind of vertically. So our, our RAM would end up being pretty thin and rather tall, right? In terms of a latch circuit. And that ended up being really cool because then all you do is you build like a nice layout of, of a RAM stick and then you just copy paste it with structure blocks these days. I used the clone command back then um, or like world, what is it, MC edit, but you know, those, it's a little tough to get those working now, but structure blocks are pretty awesome. So let's synthesize this information into an actionable set of requirements, right? First and foremost, need a circuit that stores data for us, one that we can easily write to and read from. And we need to be able to access all the numerous addresses in that circuit as efficiently as possible. So optimally, we want to request and address in binary and be able to perform a read-write operation on that particular register. So take a moment to think about which components that we'll actually need to accomplish something like this. Again, we're going to pull the same magic that we did last time where we list out all the crap that we've gone through this entire semester, right? And of course, I'll kind of skip the formality here and just show you. It's actually all this stuff right here. I mean, it uses a bunch of the things that we've built before, right? And you've seen this stuff, decoder and encoder, multiplexer demux, and of course, latches and flip-flops to store the data. Again, addressable memory, is kind of complex, but not much worse than what you've already seen because you're strong now. You know this stuff, right? You're a, you're a Minecraft logical circuit aficionado. So this is the stuff that really is required for building something like this. And we're going to talk a little bit more about implementation details. So we've got a general idea of how we're going to build our RAM. And we've seen a picture of how it's done on computers. We also know the general components that we want to be employing in this implementation. So the big question is, how will we actually implement it? Because I've kind of beaten around the bush so far. Well, we'll be implementing SRAM, so no need for a capacitor here, which is good. And we'll be using D flip-flops. Now, the D in this case stands for data. I'm, I'm actually not 100% on that. I'm pretty sure that's what it stands for. <laughs> um, but think of a D flip-flop as an augmented version of the SR flip-flops we learned about earlier, right? So the flip-flop looks a little interesting in Minecraft, right? It looks different logically than the flip-flop that we built in SR form, um, but it works exactly the same. The reason we're building this this way, and um, we'll get some demo in from, uh, some demo content from Ashwath that'll really make it clear um, how to put this stuff together. But it's basically just easier to build. It's more compact, and as you can imagine, um, as, as time went by, people just kept iterating and improving on these logical circuit designs and mooshing them down to a, as small as possible, just like they did in real life. Something similar beautifully played out in Minecraft, where people just kept iterating on logical circuit designs. Like, I'm sure the XOR gate used to look ugly until some clown decided to try a weird um, new layout with a bunch of, I don't know, places and torches in some new places. Compact it down. Oh, sorry. That was... Okay, hopefully I'm back now. Um, yeah, compact it down. Um, and make it into something, you know, smaller, compact, and still functional. So same stuff with this, this innovation. Uh, we're just going to use this layout in particular because, um, like I said, it's smaller. It fits better in our circuits. Uh, and it accomplished the exact same thing that we want. The reason, you know, we teach the um, 
the big laid out logic gate version of this is just to get you all to understand you know what exactly is going on um and how it works the way it does but in reality when we're building in minecraft we're going to build a smaller more mushed up version of it and you're not going to see the individual logic gates unless you really pay attention to them to what the build is right so it's basically your old flip-flop with an added special feature we're making sure the same signal isn't fed in from both s and i now if this is confusing for you and uh, you know i I'm not pushing that you understand this completely, completely. Um, it's just basically a very cool way to use flip-flops to store data. Um, and our write read is um, uh, all taken care of. Like, it's it's a little uh, easier to um, fit with the rest of our circuit. So, architectural choice there. Just like before, each flip-flop can be seen as one bit of memory, right? That is, each of these fancy circuits can store either a one or a zero. Now, I'll take this moment to kind of ask, you might be thinking, okay, well, one flip-flop stores one bit, and that's cool and all, but that's not enough to store a register, right? And you're completely right. The results of our calculations, like our, the numbers that we add and stuff, you know, those can take up to three bits. That's quite a lot of bits, and more than we are dealing with right now. So what I'm trying to say is that every, before we had a row and column kind of addressing of RAM, but we're going to take this one step further. We're going to say, okay, what if we just addressed a row, right? But when we addressed a row and requested a row, let's say we wanted like row three of our RAM, right? Or, you know, R3 of our RAM. Instead of sending back one bit, we could ask our circuit to say, hey, you know the three um, registers that you've got, or the three flip-flops you've got sitting in row three? Just send me back all of their data, right? So that's basically what we're doing. We're addressing by row, um, but each row that we're pulling back data from, we're going to get three bits, three of these flip-flop setups um, for address, right? So of course, we're going to need a lot more of these, right? You can imagine that if we wanted, say, we wanted to have five registers, um, and each of those registers would have three bits each, then all we would need to do is build 15 of these flip-flops. So my personal recommendation is build three of these flip-flops, all together in one row, right? And that would be one addressable memory address. That would be your one register. From there, it's a cakewalk. Just build out the rest of your registers by copy pasting it using structure blocks. And just, you know, paste them right down next to each other, and then address them using mux, and you're good to go. So, you know, let's assume that we now have a ton of these bad boys all laid out in some sort of matrix and you know we actually talked about efficiently accessing and addressing the ones that we want well, we went through that already right efficient memory addressing in the previous lecture you know all good we, we kind of went over that stuff so like I said before we're gonna have to use a demux right and remember my lecture on memory and how it would turn out to be spaghetti if we didn't have a demux or wires that's basically what we're getting at here we're going to be using an array in a weird way for simplicity's sake. Um, and there's another very cool reason we want to build these RAM blocks in order, right? Um, and this actually ties back to uh, computer science as well, right? I mean, it's called block sizes, right? And this, this kind of ties into a, to more interesting memory concepts. We don't screw around with this too much, but there is a reason um, perhaps that you want some sort of memory construct that makes sense. Um, right, because we see this concept being called upon in languages where, um, uh, what's the word, spatial, like locality is, is, uh, is appreciated, right, um, memory locality, I, I'm forgetting the word, um, but you know, in things like C, where if you, um, load in or if you access an element from an array, chances are you're probably going to be hitting that array again and again, right? So what, what your program on your computer will do at a very high level is if you access an element from an array, so you will already have loaded in some chunk of that array uh, into your cache so that if you access, you know, array element plus one, um, C is going to be like, oh, you know what, no problem. Well, we got that bad boy in cache already, so we can just give you the second block of it. And uh, you end up getting performance increase um, just because of the way that the cache works, that memory is being pulled in. Um, that's a very, again, humongous oversimplification and that's not exactly um, how that works. But I just want to introduce this concept because, I mean, say your block size is four, right? And you want to pull the block starting at n, 
All you need to do is use a counter. You'll be able to pull from n and plus one and plus two, uh, contiguous memory, right? Um, so this is useful for our architecture because again, that's not really how registers work. Um, but we can totally use that if we wanted to say write some code that would iterate through the RAM, right? We can just increase registers one by one if we wanted to perhaps store an array within our registers. So I mean. Weird little workaround, but that kind of allows us to do a lot more neat things with our computer programs. Um, so again, it's all about taking the architecture and the limitations that we have um, and really pushing the limits of them, right? Figuring out these weird little things that we can do um, in order to make other functionality just a lot better. So that's what we've got here. Um, and just, just that's my little spiel on, on arrays. We don't actually do stuff with the quote-unquote arrays in this class, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because you know, we have limitations in our architecture, but that doesn't mean um, that we can't push that architecture to do complex things. And that's another part of designing these digital logic circuits, right? It's one thing to build these circuits, but it's also another thing to ensure that you have the ability to sort of intelligently push these circuits, these limited circuits, to do things, um, you know, that, that push the envelope, that are complex operations, you're taking advantage of little shortcuts and stuff like that to um, simulate higher level functionality in what is a fairly dumb circuit. So, wrapping this all up, because we are we are just about, you know, ending soon, we're straying from real world architecture choices a bit. That much is clear, right? But don't forget that this is still a game. We try to make it simple. We don't have to concern ourselves with the nuances of electronics. Nor do we have the spe spatial limitations of the real world. That's great for us because we don't have to build capacitors or any, any weird stuff. Um, what we do have is limited time and workload expectation. So that's what we're forced to work with, right? If you wanted to recreate the Intel Core i7 within Minecraft, you could. And I think that's beautiful. But we will never make you do anything like that. Um, we've made things easier when making certain architectural choices, right? You are still building a functional computer in this class but a very simple one. And the reason being, we just, we want to make it easy on time, right? Like I said, there are a lot of weird nuances involved with making architecture that uses more than one level of memory, right? Um, so we're just going to stick with one clear persistent memory construct, which is registers. But like I mentioned in the previous slide, just because we're using, you know, registers um, in, that, in that definition doesn't mean that we're limited um, to using them just as registers, right? If we have a bunch of sequential memory sitting together, there's no reason why we can't leverage that memory and write some code ourselves um, to mess around with, you know, maybe some sequential uh, memory storage, right? We could use uh, three registers that are contiguous um, to perhaps store a small array. So, you know, that's just my little spiel there, throwing it out there. Like, limitations don't necessarily mean uh, that we're totally bogged down by them. You can find workarounds is all I'm trying to say. And we've kind of talked about the RAM and stuff and how you're, you're going to build it at a very high level. Like I said, this project is mainly just, um, you know, building that, that mux demux setup, building one set of like three RAM bits. And honestly, if you build one um, with a little bit of uh, intelligent copy pasting with the structure blocks, you could probably get away with just building one and copy pasting it over and over. But it's not too bad, right? Um, I, I call this the copy paste project. It's not not too bad at all. And then next week, we'll talk a little bit about our final exam, or maybe I'll, I'll release some information on it before that, but the final, oh, no, sorry, no, I keep saying I said exam, I didn't mean exam, final project, no panic, please, there is no final exam. <laughs> I should not have said it like that. I um, hope I didn't say final exam before, but no, there is no exam, it is a final project, and it's basically just connecting all of the components that you've built together, right? Um, it's not that bad. It really is not that bad. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it next week. And that is, you know, just about time for this week. So I'll, I'll stick around a little bit to take questions. But that's what we've got. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop the OBS recording. Stop recording.